Maybe we watch too much true crime TV, but we sure are used to the bad guy getting caught in the end. <laughs> However, unfortunately, crime in real life doesn't get wrapped up neatly after an hour. Sometimes it takes decades before the true culprit is revealed. And sometimes, even more chillingly, they never get caught at all. Hide under your blankets and lock your doors, viewers, because today we're looking at three chilling cold cases that still need answers. Saturday, September 18, 1999, was a mild night in Felixstowe, UK, a port town in Suffolk, not far from Ipswich. 17-year-old Victoria Hall, known as Vicky to her loved ones, and her friend Gemma Alger took advantage of the pleasant weather and went out dancing at the Bandbox nightclub. As their evening ended, the pair left the Bandbox and stopped by Bodrum Grill House for a bite to eat before making the 2.5-mile trek toward their respective homes in the village of Trimley St. Mary. Around 2.20 in the morning of September 19, 1999, Gemma and Vicky said their goodbyes at the intersection of High Road and Faulkner's Way, mere yards from Vicky's home. Not long after leaving her friend, Gemma heard screams in the night, and while they spooked her, she assumed it was just some people messing around. However, when Vicky's parents, Graham and Lorinda Hall, woke in the morning and realized Vicky had never made it home, the screams Gemma overheard took on a far more ominous tone. A search was launched for the young woman, but authorities did not have to wait for long. Five days after her disappearance, an unsuspecting dog walker in Creeding St. Peter, a small town 25 miles north of Trimley St. Mary, stumbled upon a nude female body in a watery ditch. Vicky had been found, though sadly, not alive. Her garments and possessions were missing, but Vicky had not been sexually assaulted. The cause of death was ruled as strangulation, and at first, it seemed like good progress was being made in her case. By the next year, in December 2000, then 27-year-old Adrian Bradshaw was arrested for her murder. The case against Bradshaw was remarkably thin and mostly relied on soil samples that couldn't conclusively tie him to the crime. In 2001, a jury unanimously cleared him of guilt. With Bradshaw ruled out, the case stood cold for years, despite fervent dedication from the Suffolk police investigators. Then, suddenly, in September 2019, Vicky's case was reopened and christened Operation Avon. New information had been brought to the attention of the police, though what exactly this is remains unknown as of now. By July 2021, there was a new suspect, notorious British serial killer Steve Wright, also known as the Ipswich Ripper, or the Suffolk Strangler, was arrested at HMP Long Larton. He is currently serving a life sentence for five other murders that he committed in and around Ipswich in 2006. He has since been released from questioning pending further inquiries, though he remains imprisoned. The status of Vicky's case remains murky. It is plausible that Wright is her killer since her murder matches his M.O., and he was present in the area at the time of her death. However, until the authorities are willing to share more information, we, the public, remain in the dark. If you have any knowledge about the murder of Vicky Hall, you can contact Suffolk Police at the number on the screen and mention Operation Avon. Alternatively, you can contact Crime Stoppers anonymously at 0800-555-111. Vicky is greatly missed by her friends and family, and as they patiently await justice, they remember her as the bright young woman that she was. It was time for work to start at the Carter Douglas Engineering Firm in Aurora, Colorado, just outside Denver, on May 24, 2004. As employees milled about, beginning their workday, one friendly face was conspicuously absent. 53-year-old Oki Albert Kite, known as Al, was usually punctual and responsible, so when one hour late turned into two, his co-workers became concerned. After multiple calls to his home and cell phone went unanswered, they contacted his sister, Barbara, who called Aurora police to do a welfare check. Aurora PD obliged, and when no one answered the door at his townhome, they forced their way inside, concerned for his safety. The main floor and upstairs bedrooms yielded no answers, but when officers descended to the basement level, 
they were in for a gruesome shock. Al was found face down, surrounded by his own blood. A wound on the back of his head was evident, indicating that he had likely been struck from behind as he walked down the stairs. The coroner later discovered that this was not the fatal blow. His body was racked with evidence of torture. He had been hogtied and beaten for hours before he was finally killed with a brutal 22 stab wounds. After murdering Al, his killer stayed in the townhome for a bit, using the shower, sleeping in Al's bed, wearing his clothes, and eating his food. However, he was meticulous in his cleanup, pouring bleach down drains, wiping down surfaces, and leaving several items, like a few knives and Al's car keys, soaking in bleach in the sink. This didn't make any sense to Al's loved ones or the police. By all accounts, Al was warm, friendly, and generous. As his girlfriend Linda Angelopoulos shared, he was a very, very nice guy, and he would give the world to anybody if they asked for it. He had no known enemies and no secrets that pointed to a double life or nefarious activities. However, despite finding his keys in the sink, Al's blue and gray GMC pickup truck was missing from the scene, as well as his cell phone, leading police to initially suspect the motive might have been robbery. The only clue investigators found that could point to a potential suspect was a rental application in Al's kitchen trash can. It was filled out with an address, social security number, phone number, and a name, Robert Cooper. Al's longtime basement tenant had recently moved out, and he had been actively looking for a new one, placing advertisements in the local papers. Apparently, according to Al's girlfriend and his sister, about a week before the murder, he had a new prospective renter in mind. Named Robert Cooper, he was supposedly new to the Denver area, worked for Wells Fargo Bank, and wanted to move in quickly. He toured Al's townhome, seemingly approved, and readily gave Al a security deposit and half of the first month's rent. Al seemed happy with the arrangement, but Linda recalls feeling slightly uneasy about Cooper. She says she was only near him once when she had to run into Al's house to use the restroom. Cooper took care to conceal his face from Linda, didn't seem interested in meeting her at all, and made an excuse to quickly leave while she was in the bathroom. She recalls him being a well-dressed man in his 40s with dark wavy hair, a cane, and a noticeable limp. Based on Linda's tip and the rental application, authorities desperately wanted to find Cooper, but one lead after another seemed to dry up. The address he provided on the application was simply the address for the University of Colorado Medical School. The social security number belonged to a random woman who was unrelated to the case, and the phone number went to a burner cell. Furthermore, when Al's truck was recovered about a block and a half from his home later that same day, the robbery motive was ruled out. Authorities found trace amounts of DNA and an ATM receipt for a nearby Wells Fargo. At first, the cops were hopeful that security footage might have captured the criminal, but he was one step ahead of them, concealing his identity on the video with a ski mask. The suspect had only taken $1,000 out of Al's bank account, even though he had more funds available. Some believe that this was the mysterious Cooper simply taking back the security deposit and rent money that he had given Al the week prior. Frustrated, the police decided to see what information they could gather from the call logs on the burner cell and Al's phone. To their surprise, both phones were still active in the Denver area, but it was soon discovered that they had been dumped in the Five Points neighborhood. This isn't the safest part of the city, and both Al's phone and the burner had been picked up and used by the homeless people who roamed Five Points, another dead end for investigators. They were able to glean from the burner phone's records, however, that the cell had been used numerous times over the past month to contact people advertising rental spaces. Aurora PD tracked down some of these would-be landlords, and they all remembered Cooper. Descriptions of him varied. Sometimes he had a limp, Sometimes he spoke with a thick Eastern European accent that one woman positively identified as Romanian. One thing they could all agree on, though, was the strange vibes that the man seemed to exude. They noted feeling uncomfortable and creeped out with a sense of relief whenever he left their presence. As of now, the working theory is that Al's murder was meticulously planned out ahead of time. It appeared that this Robert Cooper was shopping for a victim, and Al was ultimately chosen because he lived alone, had few local friends and family, and sadly, 
because his kind-hearted nature made him an easy target. There was some usable fingerprints and DNA left by the killer at the scene, and though that has been used to create a likely image of the killer, it has never been matched to anyone. He is of Southeastern European heritage, though he may or may not have been born there. He is thought to be between 5'8 and 5'10 inches tall and roughly 175 pounds. It is difficult to pin down his age since different witnesses identified him as anywhere between 20 to 50 years old, but he is likely in his 40s with dark hair, dark eyes, and very pale skin. Investigators do have a list of behavioral characteristics that the killer might have exhibited. He may have been from the east coast of the United States, particularly the New Jersey area. He might have been familiar with the banking system or have previously worked for Wells Fargo. He may or may not have female family members living in Aurora. He was likely familiar with the University of Colorado Hospital in Denver and typically dressed professionally. Lastly, he may have tried and failed to become a law enforcement officer before turning to crime. There are no concrete suspects in this case, though some have suggested that the notorious serial killer Israel Keyes might be responsible. Experts consulted for a TV special about the case have noted that some of the torture Al suffered, as well as the way he was bound, is very similar to methods used by the Turkish Hezbollah, a group of violent religious radicals. The most likely and terrifying answer is that good-natured Al Kite was picked at random by someone who just wanted to kill. All we can hope is that that person is no longer out there. If you know anything about the murder of Al Kite, you can contact Detective McDonald of the Aurora Police Department at 303-739-6013. Additionally, Denver Crime Stoppers has issued a $2,000 reward for information regarding this case, and you can contact them anonymously at 720-913-913. 7867, or you can leave a tip online at MetroDenverCrimestoppers.com. Dear viewers, the next case involves crimes against a child and may not be suitable for all audiences. Since this is our last case today, if you feel this might be difficult for you in any way, please go ahead and close the video. At the young age of 12 years old, Selena Mays had already had a rough start. Both her parents battled drug addiction in the early years of her life, which caused their relationship to be violent, fraught, and tumultuous. Though her mother and father split up and finally got clean, when Selena was 10 in 1994, her mother suddenly died of a brain aneurysm. A bitter custody battle between her father, CJ, and her deceased mother's family ensued. CJ eventually won, and Selena was taken to live with him and his extended family in Willingboro, New Jersey, where his sister, Sarita Smith, was the pastor at Gospel of Christ Ministries. The house in Willingboro was crowded, and all aspects of life revolved around the church. Selena was surrounded by cousins, siblings, and various other church members, and it was overwhelming. She had gone from living quietly with her mother to being thrust into a deeply communal way of life that involved homeschooling, constant religious service, and various other activities like selling pretzels or shilling Mary Kay cosmetics to create more income for the church. Gospel of Christ Ministries has faced some heat from the public and was accused of being a cult by former members. Sarita was said to be very controlling and demanding. It was likely a difficult time for the preteen, and in 1996 those difficulties compounded. Selena discovered that she was pregnant, Though she refused to name the father of her child, she did note to her gynecologist that she had a 16-year-old boyfriend who did not attend her family's church. This was not very likely. Sarita kept a tight leash on all members of her congregation, and the children were hardly allowed to do any activities that didn't involve the church in some form. Neighbors of the home in Willingboro noted that none of the children were even allowed to play outside. Upset with his daughter's unwillingness to be forthright with the father's identity, CJ threatened Selena with a test to determine paternity once the baby arrived. Nevertheless, Selena was reportedly happy about becoming a mother. She dutifully took her prenatal vitamins and frequently checked in with her doctor to ensure the baby's health. On the morning of December 16, 1996, when Selena was nine months pregnant and due any day, her family woke to find only pillows jammed under the covers of Selena's bed. She was missing and had left behind her purse and prenatal vitamins. She has never been seen again.
The baby's due date of December 29, 1996, passed with no sign of her, and everyone was very concerned since Selena's young age meant her pelvis was still quite narrow. Birth would have been very difficult and potentially rather complicated for her. Her father speculated that his daughter ran away to avoid the paternity test he threatened her with. Other theories are decidedly more ominous. Some believe that Selena went into labor at home and died, with her family members quietly disposing of the bodies after the fact. Others think it was a botched termination that led to her demise. No one knows for sure who the father of her child was, but suspects include her father, a cousin, and the mystery 16-year-old. Since Selena was a minor at the time, whoever it was would be guilty of a serious sexual offense. Perhaps she was murdered to cover up the initial crime that had resulted in her pregnancy. CJ has largely been ruled out since he submitted medical evidence of a vasectomy. The cousin, who is Sarita's son, Sean, has been interviewed numerous times by the police and vehemently maintains his innocence. However, in 1998, he was arrested and charged with aggravated sexual assault against two teens who attended his mother's church and lived at the home in Willingboro. In 2019, CJ passed away, to complicate matters, the maternal and paternal sides of Selena's family each believe the other party is responsible. The Mays accused Selena's maternal family of spiriting her away to Florida, while her mother's family believes that the Mays had something nefarious to do with her disappearance. Selena was a beautiful, bright child who suffered far more than she should have. She deserved to have a chance to figure out who she wanted to be and what kind of impact she would leave on this world. The adults in her life failed to keep her safe and her fate may never be known. When she vanished, Selena was five feet tall, 120 pounds, and she would now be 39 years old. She is described as a biracial woman of black and white heritage, though she is sometimes mischaracterized as being Hispanic or Latin. She also has black hair, brown eyes, and eyebrows that sometimes grow into a unibrow. Her child, if they survived, would be 27 years old. Their gender is unknown. Though as the years pass, it becomes less and less likely that Selena and her baby are alive. The case is still classified as a missing person. If you know anything about the disappearance of Selena Mays, please contact the Willingboro Police Department at the number on the screen. You can also reach out to the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800-THE-LOST. We want to hear your theories in the comments. Who do you think killed Al Kite? Is Selena Mays still alive? Keep your eyes peeled for our second installment of Unexplained Cold Cases, coming soon. Be sure to like and subscribe. Until next time, thanks for watching.